Did you know honeybees know what zero is? It's true, it turns out bees, like dolphins, parrots, and monkeys, can understand the difference between nothing and something. Scientists trained bees to choose the picture with the least number of dots from a set of dot pictures. And when faced with images of dots versus a blank card, the bees were more likely to select the nothing card, which is pretty impressive considering humans have been thinking about the concept of zero for millennia and still run into problems with it. As far as we can tell, the earliest use of zero was for what we now call place value, like to differentiate 25 from 205. And some cultures, like basically all of Europe until the 12th century, just avoided zero. The idea that zero really is a number has only been recognized worldwide for the last few hundred years, at least by humans. No word on the bees. Even now, there are lots of unresolved questions that are tricky to tackle and are troublesome for us to understand. Like, what really happens when we divide by zero? So today, let's see what all the buzz is about and try to figure out what's really going on with zero. G'day, I'm James Tanton, and congratulations on making it to our final episode of Study Hall Algebra, presented by Arizona State University and Crash Course. Most people who make it to college algebra are familiar with the cardinal rule, thou shalt not divide by zero. But that's not the only hole zero leaves in our knowledge. Zero restricts our equations and causes special cases that need careful thinking. So if we're really going to explore algebra fully and build a solid foundation for the rest of our mathematical careers, we have to deal with zero. For instance, zero requires a special case and challenges our thinking even when we're just solving quadratic equations. And we're pretty good at those by now. With typical quadratics, you get into a rhythm of solving for a positive and negative answer. Like if x squared equals 9, then x is positive 3, and x is negative 3. So if we're solving x squared equals 0, then x equals positive 0 and negative 0? Hmm. If we think back to our dots and anti-dots, negative 3 is the number we can add to 3 to get 0. 3 anti-dots cancel out 3 dots. So negative 0 has to be the number we add to 0 to still get 0. But actually 0 itself fits that description. 0 plus 0 equals 0. So 0 and negative 0 are really the same thing. Which means 0 is neither positive nor negative. And there's just one answer to x squared equals 0, namely x equals 0. Another place that 0 gives us trouble is when we try to raise it to the zeroth power. For any other number like 1 to the 0 or 42 to the 0, we know anything raised to the zeroth power will equal 1. Even something like 0 0.001 to the zeroth power equals 1. So it seems like 0 to the 0 should be 1 as well. But on the other hand, exponents are really helping us write long repeated multiplications quite succinctly. So 0 squared is 0 times 0, which evaluates to 0. And 0 to the third power is 0 times 0 times 0, which equals still 0. In fact, 0 to any positive power will be 0. So if we try to sneak up on 0 to the 0th power and put in smaller and smaller positive powers, like 0 to the half, or 0 to the 0 0.1, which is the tenth root of 0, or 0 to the 0 0.000001, which is the millionth root of 0, we always get 0. So now it seems like 0 to the 0th power should be 0 as well. And the answer is... Well, it depends on who you ask. If you chatted up a theoretical mathematician, someone who spends their time figuring out new math based on abstract ideas, they'd probably say that zero to the zeroth power is undefined. We literally can't assign a number to it. They'd argue that zero to the zero can be anything you want. Based on our exponent rules, we know that x to the a times x to the b equals x to the a plus b. So, for example, zero to the three times zero to the zero would have to equal zero to the three plus zero, or zero to the third power. But we know zero cubed is zero and anything multiplied by zero will be zero. So we have zero times zero to the zeroth power equals zero, which is true no matter what value we assign to zero to the zeroth power. Put in zero to the zero equals 36, and we're good. Put in zero to the zero equals 722, and we're still good. Too many values make these math sentences true. So theoretical mathematicians throw up their hands and just deem it undefined. But if you ask a programmer or a geophysicist or many other kinds of applied mathematicians, people who use math to solve real world problems, they'd probably tell you that zero to the zero is one, or at least that it's convenient to set it as one. For instance, zero to the zeroth power equals one in most modern programming languages, because it's easier to work with a number than an undefined value. Moreover, if we graph the function y equals x to the x power, its path seems to agree with applied mathematicians. As we walk along the curve as x gets closer to zero, and we had no other information, we'd expect zero to the zeroth power to be one. Now, to deal with negative powers of zero, which moves exponents to the denominator, we have to finally see what's really going on when we divide by zero. Ramagupta, the seventh century mathematician and astronomer, was the first to write about how to use zero in arithmetic. He proposed adding, subtracting, and multiplying zero exactly like we still do today. According to his description, if we pretend a is any old number, then for addition, a plus zero is a. For subtraction, a minus zero is a. And for multiplication, a times zero is zero but he didn't address what happens when we divide by zero. Well, I'll let you in on the secret. The sky doesn't come crashing down. 
but you end up with some math that's just plain not true. For instance, let's see how we can prove that two equals one. First, let's declare x equals one. Then we can say the expression x squared minus x equals x squared minus one. And if we factored each side, we can rewrite this as x times x minus one equals x plus one times x minus one. And that's okay so far. At this point, we're experienced equation solvers. So when we see the same term multiplied on both sides, we have an impulse to divide both sides by x minus one. But wait, what was that again? That's sneakily dividing by zero. So let's see what chaos ensues. So now we have x plus one equals x. Well, that seems a little weird. Since we decided x equals one at the very beginning, this means we have that one plus one equals one. Two equals one. And this is an example of the chaos that happens when we divide by zero, even when it's in disguise. Not dividing by zero sounds easy to do, just don't. But you also have to watch out for expressions that could possibly be equal to zero, like here, when we divide it by x minus one, which is zero if x equals one. But that still doesn't answer what's technically going on when we divide by zero. And when we're having trouble understanding something, one way to start doing something is to build intuition for what we already know. So let's go back to the basics with the counting numbers and think about division in general. People have always found something intuitively wrong with dividing by zero. We have something like, 12 divided by three equals four, we can think of that as taking 12 for something and splitting it up into three groups. 12 apples shared amongst three people is four apples per person. 12 apples for two people, six apples per person. 12 apples for one person, 12 apples per person. 12 apples for no people? Hmm, a big question mark. We still have 12 objects and we can't just zap them out of existence, but we've got nowhere to put them. Now we know 12 divided by three equals four is true because we can reverse it. Three times four is 12 we can multiply to get back to where we started. But that's not possible with something divided by zero. Since we don't know the answer, let's just say 12 divided by zero is n. When we try to work backwards, we'll always get zero times n is zero, not 12, no matter what n we choose. But maybe there's an exception. Brahmagupta thought that zero divided by zero must be equal to zero. And in a sense, he's not wrong. Zero times zero does get you back to zero. The problem is that zero times anything gets us back to zero. So we could just as well say that zero divided by zero is seven, or 413, or the square root of five. It's the same problem we had with zero to the zeroth power. Zero divided by zero could be any number, and that means we have to call it undefined. Working with zero requires some careful attention and fancy footwork in algebra class, but it's human nature to want to push the boundaries and flirt with danger. So it may not come as a surprise to learn that we've devised a way to get close to dividing by zero. So let's have a look into the mathematical future and shoot for the stars with our math telescope. After all, stargazing is really a mathematical endeavor. The closest star to our sun is Proxima Centauri, over four light years away. But closest is a relative term. It's actually so far away that light rays are essentially parallel by the time they reach Earth. So when astronomers want to study distant stars, they use parabolic mirrors to get those parallel rays of light to bounce and reform a picture of the star. And if you bounce something off a flat mirror, you can predict the exact direction it will travel. So let's think about our parabola as lots of tiny tilted flat mirrors that look like a curve if you squint. The smaller the pieces, the more accurate our estimations of bouncing light will be. Now, how each piece is tilted affects how light bounces off. And we can calculate the slope of each flat piece. It's just the slope of the line, or the rise over the run. So let's divide the curve of the parabolic mirror into smaller and smaller pieces, that is, smaller runs. Then it looks like each mirror is eventually becoming just a point. But wait, we can't find the slope with just one point. That's trying to divide by zero. Instead, we can calculate the slope of the smaller and smaller lines and see what value they're approaching. This new number will be the slope of the line that passes through that one tiny mirror point, which actually controls how the light will bounce off. So let's say our parabola looks like y equals x squared, and we want to know how light bounces off the point three comma nine. First, draw a line between three comma nine and say four comma 16, and find its slope, seven. Now keep going, draw smaller and smaller lines. We're approaching a slope of six. So now we have all the information to calculate where the ray that bounces off the point three comma nine will go in our final image of the star. Without algebra, we'd never be able to find those lines or do calculus, and we'd be lost among the stars. So we hope you'll use your algebra skills in calculus and beyond. We've done our best here in study hall algebra to solve mysteries, fill in the gaps, and answer age old questions. But we hope our time together has also sparked new questions. After all, puzzling about mathematics can be a fabulous lifelong joy. And sometimes in your math journey, you will get stuck. So here's what you can do to keep going. The biggest and best thing you do is trust your instincts. Most people just accept math as rules and declarations. But if something feels hazy and intimidating, you're sensing something deep that's worth thinking about. So ask questions, make mistakes, have emotions, and do something, anything, to start tackling a challenge. And finally, be kind to yourself. Know you were doing in days, weeks, or months what humankind has spent over 2,000 years on. And that's a lot to fit into a single lifetime, let alone one class. But here you are, working through it. 
And if you've gotten this far, you can go a lot further. Thanks for watching Study Hall Algebra, which is produced by Arizona State University and the Crash Course team at Complexly. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us here at Study Hall, be sure to subscribe. And you can learn more about ASU in the videos produced by Crash Course in the links in the description. Thanks so much for watching.